1846, it was a very productive year. It was a year in which the Mexican-American War began, a year in which the Oregon Territory was acquired. It was a year in which uh, Herman Melville wrote the predecessor of Moby Dick, a book called Tepe. The Pius IX ascended the papal throne after the death of Gregory the Sixteenth. The rotary printing press was invented. The sewing machine was invented. And the first baseball game was played. Who knows who played in that first baseball game? Who knows? Do you know, Michael? No idea. No idea. Oh, my goodness. The Hoboken Nine, I think it was. What was it? New York Nine. That was what it is. He, they beat the Knickerbockers 27 to 1, despite the fact that the Knickerbockers' owner, Alexander Cartwright, served as an empire. Those were the days when you could really trust empires. I think one of the most uh, important books was the book published by Fowler titled Matrimony or Phrenology and Physiology Applied to the Selection of Congenial Companions for Life. That was a very important book. The Smithsonian Institution was founded by a grant from the illeg illegitimate son of the Duke of Northumberland, Smithson. And uh, the donation at that time was a half a million dollars. 1.6 million Irish immigrants came to the United States fleeing the potato famine. And of course, 1846 was the year that anesthesia was discovered. That year, right there, with the discovery of the anesthetic effects of diethyl ether. Before the discovery of the anesthetic effects of diethyl ether, there was a lot of agony in this world. That's exemplified by this cartoon of a man having his leg amputated. The amputation usually would take less than a minute, less than a minute of excruciating pain. That's described very well in a book called Ether Day by Julie Finster. The suffering from the absence of anesthesia was enormous. It's not that the drugs to cause anesthesia were unavailable, or that the means to deliver them were unknown. Anybody know who synthesized diethyl ether? No one knows. Valerus Cordis synthesized diethyl ether in the 1540s, 200 years before the discovery of anesthesia. You say, well, yeah, he synthesized it, but who knew it was going to be important to anesthesia? This fellow already suggested that possibility. This is Theophrastus Bombastus Paracelsus de Hohenheim. He noted that ether caused analgesia. Now, you'd think someone would put two and two together and uh, come up with anesthesia. In fact, you'd think that because Ether and similar substances were used for frolics. That is, they were used for inebriation, during which time we were sure uh, that some insensibility took place, that freedom from pain was known by the participants. Nitrous oxide was discovered in 1774 by Joseph Priestley, a Unitarian minister who did science at his off time. Humphrey Davy took up nitrous oxide, studied it, and published a book on it in 1800. That's more than 40 years before the discovery of anesthesia. It was known for its entertaining properties. And here you see Davy. There's Davy and Beddoes. These are the people who ran the pneumatic institution in Bristol. And they're giving gases, including nitrous oxide, to various patients for therapeutic purposes. This was a cartoon that suggested there might be other than therapeutic purposes for which the inhaled anesthetics were used or inhaled gases were used. But Davy did more than play with nitrous oxide. He noted that as nitrous oxide in its extensive operation appears capable of destroying physical pain, it may probably be used with advantage during surgical operations in which no great effusion of blood takes place. Chloroform, 
synthesized in the 1830s by Liebig, Subrain, and Guthrie, each independently, was not applied to anesthesia. Nor was nitrous oxide, nor was ether, even though they had been known for up to two centuries before the discovery of anesthesia. And one might ask why. Why? Why not? With this agony, with this terrible agony that surgery imposed, by the limitation of surgery that the agony imposed. You couldn't, you couldn't subject anyone to more than a minute or two of the pain that these people experienced with surgery. Why wasn't anesthesia discovered? There is no answer. There is the suggestion by Norm Bergman and by Emanuel Pamper that it required a different view of life from society, that it required a view that said that the individual in society rather than the group was important. That was something that came about as a result of what we call the romantic movement, not romantic love, but the romantic movement said that the individual is important and worthwhile. It made acceptable a search for something that would decrease the agony suffered by individuals. Now, who was the first to use ether for anesthesia? Who was it? Crawford Long was the first to use ether. Crawford Long was a Georgia gentleman, actually came from medical school in Philadelphia. A gentleman, a uh, very good physician, who used diethyl ether in several operations. And in Georgia he is thought of as the discoverer of anesthesia. But nowhere else in the world is he thought of as the discoverer of anesthesia. Why is that? He didn't publish it. He didn't publish it without publication, without going out to the television station saying, I've got something here. He doesn't deserve any credit. And indeed, uh, for most of the world, he doesn't get any credit. Now, the inebriating effect of nitrous oxide, been known for some time, I suggested that Davy used it for that purpose. But more importantly, Showman used it for that purpose. You can see the drunken state that some people got into breathing from bags containing nitrous oxide. And it was used for exhibitions, exhibitions of the inebriating effect. Both the audience who breathed the nitrous oxide and the audience who viewed those who breathed the nitrous oxide would be entertained. This was used by the showman Garner Colton in a display of the inebriating effects of nitrous oxide attended by a man named Horace Wells. Horace Wells breathed the nitrous oxide and so did a clerk. Believe, uh, Samuel Cooley was his name. Breathed the nitrous oxide. Cooley became inebriated and ran about the stage and as Wells put it, jammed his shin against one of the settees, one of the benches. And he came back and sat down beside Wells, and Wells noted that uh, Cooley was bleeding. He said, didn't, didn't that hurt you? Cooley said, no, no, I didn't, didn't feel a thing. Wells, who was a dentist, thought, I could use this in my practice. I could practice painless dentistry. He tried it first on himself, on himself and discovered that it worked. He had one of his teeth pulled, removed while under the influence of nitrous oxide. You can see his colleagues at the door waiting to run out in case Wells became violent. This is Riggs, a colleague of Wells who pulled Wells' tooth. That was a success, and Wells used nitrous oxide in his practice for several weeks before attempting a public demonstration, a demonstration of the effects of nitrous oxide in what's now called the ether dome at Massachusetts General Hospital. The experiment failed. The patient, although he clearly had some insensibility, cried out in the middle of the operative procedure. And the audience, composed of medical students and residents, sent Wells from the operating room with cries of humbug, humbug, humbug. No one believed that anesthesia was possible. 
and then came the discovery. Who discovered and publicized the effects of ether? A name you all should know. William Morton. William Morton. William Morton. William Morton brought this great gift to all of us, and we owe him an enormous debt. This is probably one of the greatest discoveries of medicine. It certainly is the discovery that has eliminated more agony than any other in medicine. William Morton was a greedy, obnoxious, cheat, embezzler, thief, who died penniless and uh, probably deserved to die penniless. But on the 16th of October, 1846, 18, yes, 1846, Ether Day, William Morton discovered and this demonstrated, this is Morton, the anesthetic effects of diethyl ether. This is the patient, Gilbert Abbott, who had a tuberculous tumor that was excised by the great surgeon Warren. At the end of the operation, which was concluded uneventfully, Warren said to the audience, Gentlemen, this is no humbug. One of the great quotes in anesthesia. Who discovered the anesthetic effects of chloroform? James Simpson. James Simpson. Sir James Simpson. It said that uh, he was trying various gases. He didn't like ether because of its pungency. He was trying various gases, and his wife, as opposed to one of his colleagues, came in and found him senseless on the floor, having sniffed too much chloroform. And then, for nearly a hundred years, we find that there were no new anesthetics that were discovered. Now, there are many things that limited the development of new anesthetics. What, what could you imagine those might be? What would limit the development of new anesthetics? Lack of technology, sure. Lack of the capacity to synthesize new compounds. And there was also a lack of a means for delivery. You had to have a certain kind of compound that we'll go into it in just a minute. There was some new activity, though, in the 1920s, 1930s, you see it right here. A whole bunch of new anesthetics, of which most important were cyclopropane and divinyl ether. What distinguished these new anesthetics was one characteristic. Anyone know what that was? Cyclopropane lacked pungency, that's right. And that was an important characteristic. And divinyl ether was less pungent than ethyl ether. But what was the other important characteristic? Uh, were they different in flammability? Cyclopropane and non-flammable anesthetic. Or does it blow up when you combine it with oxygen and put a spark in it? It explodes. In fact, there have been some deaths. So non-flammability wasn't it. Yes? They were less soluble. They were less soluble. So they allowed a radical change in the quality of anesthesia. They allowed patients to awaken in a few minutes as opposed to an hour, which it could take after diathlase anesthesia. So these were an important advance, but they still were flammable. They still could blow up. And thus, these anesthetics only incrementally improved anesthesia. And then we had the Second World War, Second World War, which advanced the cause of anesthesia dramatically. How did it do that? How does a war advance anesthesia? That's exactly right. Exactly right. So we learned how to deal with the chemistry of fluorine. And that was vital to the development of the modern inhaled anesthetics, which are all fluorine. What was the other detail? Well, before the Second World War, the people who went into anesthesia were often misfits. They were thought of the drunks, the drug addicts, 
they, people who really couldn't do anything else, so they gave them anesthesia. I went into anesthesia shortly after that. You should know that uh, there were some great people who also went into anesthesia in and before that time. People like Ralph Waters, who founded the first department of anesthesiology at the University of Wisconsin in, I believe, the 1920s or 1930s. Uh, but the skills, the capacities, the qualities of people who went into anesthesia before the Second World War were limited. And then the Second World War demanded that we have a large group, a cadre of anesthetists. And people were told, people out of medical school, nurses, were told, you will learn anesthesia. And many of them discovered they liked it. And we had a nucleus of good people who liked to give anesthesia, who discovered it was a rewarding experience. Now, we have different anesthetics as the modern anesthetics. And they are shown to the left of this curve, all over here. Sebofluorine, desflurane, isoflurane, enflurane, methoxyflurane, halothane, and an anesthetic that probably none of you have ever heard of, fluoroxine. What distinguished those anesthetics from their predecessors? What is it? Fluorination. Fluorination. That's what distinguished them all from their predecessors. The first really successful one was halothane, and it was enormously successful, within a few years displacing the previous anesthetics, uh, the ones that had been our mainstays of practice for a hundred or more years, diethyl ether, chloroform, uh, cyclopropane, all were replaced by halothane. Why was it such a success? Why was the gentleman over here? Non-flammable. Non-flammable. Less pungent. Solubility. Solubility was good. Solubility was excellent. Rapid recovery. And what about toxicity? It was much less toxic than its competition, which was chloroform. Chloroform injured everybody's liver who breathed it. Halothane did not although it did cause hepatotoxicity, and we'll get back to that in the discussion of hepatotoxicity. What were its drawbacks besides that toxicity? It's a rhythmogenic, right. And it's a very profound circulatory depressant. Unlike the ethers which followed, it uh, caused depression of cardiac output in a dose-related manner, and you could kill someone readily with halothane. The synthesis of the anesthetics that followed halothane was accomplished by this gentleman, who's Ross Turrell, a genius in fluorine chemistry. He synthesized all of the modern anesthetics that we have used. He synthesized enflurane, synthesized sebofluorine, isoflurane, and desflurane. He synthesized some 700 compounds in a search for a better inhaled anesthetic. And those came from his work. Now, these anesthetics differed from halothane. How did they differ? How did they differ? How were the anesthetics that Ross Terrell synthesized, enthrane, sebofluorane, how did they differ? They were less soluble, that's correct. So they were less soluble. What else? Increased fluorination, that's right. So less soluble, less toxic, less metabolized, except for methoxyfluorine. And let's see, more fluorine, that, that was right. That's an impressive list. How do they differ chemically? Were they um, halogenated methyl ethyls rather than halogenated um, alkanes. alkanes? Right. So they were ethers as opposed to halothane, which was an alkane. 
What did that do? Why was that an important advance? Gave the molecule a greater stability. Uh, it was more stable, but it wasn't because of the ether structure. The ether structure also can be unstable. So the ether conveyed stability in particular instances, but not for all compounds. But what, do, what separates alkanes from ethers? Well, both are hydrocarbons in a sense. What was, the, what was wrong with halothane? What did it do that you didn't like clinically? Arrhythmias. And what do these new anesthetics do? None. No arrhythmias. And that's a characteristic of all the alkanes. All the alkanes are arrhythmogenic, some much more than others. Who knows why the development of desferrin and sevoflurane was delayed? There wasn't a perceived need. That was the most important reason. They were also more expensive to make and more difficult to make. This is the first administration of desferrin to a human being. The fellow who looks like Napoleon is Ron Jones. The volunteer to receive this is Dr. Jeremy Cashman, who uh, I thought was a brave soul. He didn't know whether he was going to live or die. And he was a member of the investigative team. And this is a view of the first patient who received sevoflurane by Professor Kita. And you can see that they did more than give anesthesia. They studied, I think, everything they could study with this patient. Well, that concludes a very brief overview of the history of anesthesia. I'd like to finish it by saying that you all have now become the inheritors of this history. You all are now practicing what I think is one of the most wonderful specialties of medicine. Wonderful in terms of what it conveys to our patients, and wonderful in terms of what it does for you as, as physicians and nurses. It is a specialty that allows you to do something that I think no other specialty does, and what I find extraordinarily attractive. I'm a control freak, as my friend Dirk Wales will tell you, and there is no specialty that allows you a greater control over a patient's life, over a patient's physiology, than does anesthesia. Power, power.